afternoon, dental internet world. My name is Dr. Vishal Sharma. I'm once again here alongside my friend and colleague, Dr. Mike Parchewski. Mike, you've been busy traveling. You've been flying all over the continent and into Europe and Asia and Istanbul to give some talks. You're a jet setter, but for this podcast, we are going to stay local, very local. In fact, we have our esteemed guest who comes right from our backyard here in Calgary, Alberta. Mike, can you introduce our guest for today? Great. Thanks, Vish. Uh, good to see you. Um, and again, welcome, Nicole Robbins, uh, local Calgary dentist, U of A grad. And, um, you know, the real focus bringing her in today is um, she has a great story. She's doing some great dentistry. And I really like when uh, young, motivated dentists uh, push their game. And at a young age, only being out of school a few years, She's already making a name for herself on social media and also in the cosmetic dentistry world, which uh, is often the more seasoned dentists get into that. So I'm super impressed with what she's doing. Lots of digital focus uh, with photography and with the, the way she does the wax ups for the patients. So we're super excited to have her here. Um, um, quick fact, uh, she's a super talented dancer as well. Um, right now it's street jazz, but she's uh, also into acro and other types of dance. Uh, so I'm super impressed by that. So welcome, uh, Nicole, to the podcast. And it's great to have you here. Amazing. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, so obviously, Mike mentioned young um, and motivated dentists, not to discriminate, Mike, you old motivated <laughs> dentist. I'm also equally as impressed with you. So Nicole, welcome. Thank you. You have a really interesting story in that you have what I would say is a unique practice at one of the offices that you practice at. You've been able to build um, a niche practice within a practice. Tell us about how you created that. What was the motivation and genesis around it? Walk us through that journey, please. Absolutely. So I hadn't even finished dental school and I spent every single weekend driving back to Calgary because I knew that's where I wanted to practice. Um, just shadowing and going about practices and really I was looking for a team environment that I knew would support me in whatever endeavors that I chose to do in dentistry. And so that's how I landed up at uh, an office out in Airdrie. And I have been there since I graduated and I started out as comprehensive dentistry. I wanted to get all of the skills I had learned at the U of A under my belt, do them good, don't sacrifice quality, but get quick. So I spent the whole first year really just going to town on everything, surgery, endo. And I do still do everything. And I have this problem where I'm obsessed with dentistry and I, <laughs> I genuinely love doing all of it. So I've been feeling a little overwhelmed lately because I am putting a lot on my plate and I'm not willing to give up all the other stuff. But I have always had this very strong innate draw to anything aesthetic dentistry um, growing up in the performing arts world, I just have this like creative side of me that has to be fulfilled. And I would spend hours in the dental clinic and, you know, drill and fill. It was satisfying, but you get to a point where that creative outlet, it gets a little stifled. And I was searching for what can I, how can I satisfy this, this part of me? Um, so that was one of the kind of the first draws into leading me towards cosmetic dentistry. And another thing that I think surprises people, because a lot of dentists ask me, you know, how do you end up doing so many cosmetic cases right now? How do you get those treatment plans? How do you close, you know, case acceptance? And that right there honestly tells me that they think about dentistry a lot differently than I do, because I never walk into an exam thinking, okay, I'm going to sell some aesthetic dentistry. That is not going through my head at all. I have, um, I know you guys follow the SOAP method with examination and getting everything clinically down pat first. Um, but I'm just getting to know the patient. And in very long winded way of answering, how did I get into the cosmetic area? How am I drawn to this is, I talk to the patients and I get to know them and I get to know their teeth and their overall health and their oral health first. Yes. Um, but, you know, at the end of the exam, you can't just storm in there asking this because you want it to be coming from a caring and non judgmental place. 
do you like your smile? What? Tell me about it. And their answer says everything you need to know. It's a picture. It says a thousand words. And how they respond to that tells me how I'm going to respond to their treatment going forwards. I love my smile. It's perfect. And, you know, in my eyes, it's there's so many things that I could do to improve it. But aesthetic dentistry, you have to approach in a very different manner than all other dentistry. You have to understand that it's subjective and you have to understand that it's not necessary. It is, you know, up to the patient. And so it has to come from them first. You're not going to walk along the street and say, hey, you need some Botox. Look at those wrinkles. Like you would never do that. You, The patient comes to you with these requests. Um, and so respectfully, you just get to know the patient and they tell you what they want. And, and I educate them on what I could do for them and why it would be important. And that's how I just ended up with a lot of aesthetic cases in my practice. I have a natural draw for the aesthetics doing it. I like to talk to people and I like to make them happy and it's a lot of fun for me. So my practice has just kind of blown up with <laughs> those cases. Very yeah. eloquently put. Mike, go ahead. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, I think that's great. And I know when Vish and I teach about digital examinations and digital techniques and, and um, case acceptance with patients, one of the biggest pieces of that is, is the, the showing the patient and a picture is, is greater than a thousand words is my feeling. And so when we do digital impressions, it's, you know, you show that to the patient and they're seeing their teeth and, you know, uh, going back to the, the primitive state of that was showing the patient a mirror and asking him those questions. You know, it's funny about everything you've said. What I, what I take out of that is you have to have time with your patient, yes. right? You, you have to actually be able to have time to have the conversation and have to listen. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when Vish and I were teaching at the Pacific Dental Conference, a big part of what we teach is that the patient has to be the quarterback and you have to listen to what they want. Yeah. But a lot of times dentists go in and they've got so, they're so boom, boom, they got to get out, they got to get yeah. in, get out. And they actually don't want to answer some of those questions because then they think, oh, it's going to be too much work. And uh, so it's, it's an interesting and it's, it's a, it is a mind shift yeah. to take it that way. 100%. Um, sorry, Visha, what were you going to add there? Yeah, no, I thought, uh, uh, Nicole, that you very eloquently put uh, why you got into cosmetics, what the passion in the background on that was. Walk us through more of the technological educational aspect. So yeah. you, you have this interest. Obviously, it's a skill set that you want to hone. For our other young dentists who maybe want to hone that skill set, what steps and courses and mentorship did you seek out? So I found a mentor actually during dental school. I started doing um, some cases in school. I had just this patient still touches my heart. A beautiful patient. Um, she was suffering from ALS and it was her lifelong dream to get her front teeth done. And so I did. I She had no other choice other than crowns. Um, we did six anterior crowns on her and seeing how impactful that was on her quality of life and how fulfilling and happy that made her really hit it home for me. And um, that was in dental school. And so that kind of was one of the first sparks. Um, and then I, I also, one of my main drivers for dentistry, my why is making it more accessible to everyone. And that doesn't always mean like I'm going to do cheap dentistry. It means people who are fearful, people who don't even know that that's an option for them. Um, and so I started getting into composites as well, because not everyone has the time, patience, money, maybe you're too anxious to sit through crown appointments, etc. There's a lot of different reasons why some treatments may be viable for some and not others. So I wanted multiple options for cosmetic dentistry. So then I started getting into bonding in dental school. And thankfully, there was a more progressive instructor at U of A who was super into bonding. And yes, we did still learn amalgam <laughs> fillings at the school. Um, but I had that there. And the first thing into bo um, bonding was actually BioClear. Um, and I got a scholarship to go do the anterior and posterior course. So I went and did that. While in dental school? Uh, I got it in dental school and then I pursued it that summer. Admirable. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, that has been great knowledge to have. Um, but I found that I 
once again, I wasn't fully satisfied with just doing BioClear. I, I wanted more. That's a very specific look. And I, I wanted to do other things for people. So then I got into layering and I honestly taught myself um, from YouTube and Instagram. And I just sat down and I created my own protocol based on what I know about bonding and what works best in my hands. And I started out just doing single teeth and I would try different methods. I would use a palatal putty. I would use mylars. I would use nothing. Just all these different things that people are using that I learned off the internet. And um, I found a way that works best for me. And then I created my own protocol for it. And I, I went with it and I just started doing more. And then I um, came across uh, with Dr. Chi, my mentor. We went to Felipe Verde's case. He is a dentist um, out foreign. He does amazing work and he has a beautiful method. And so I actually just came back from that a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I would highly recommend like if young dentists are looking for, you know, if they don't want to take the time and patience to to do what I did and and play and kind of create their own method. Um, I know a lot of dentists like it, like one, two, three, what do I do? Tell me. Um, Every, everybody wants the recipe. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if, if you want the recipe, um, he's your man. It was a a really good course. Um, he has an amazing method and I would highly recommend that and course. Where was that? Um, I took it in Houston, Texas. Yeah. He does come to the States every once in a while. I don't think he comes to Canada. Um, but he does run it like all over the world. If you look up his Instagram, he's always posting his, his next dates. I know he has like at least 20 courses coming up. So, um, very relevant for. So that that's very cool. Um, now you you touched on a couple key points there. One is is the internet, and and I know I know you had mentioned um, when we were chit chatting that you had you had taken an endo course with Manor Haas, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I was with him in Istanbul where I was teaching on on artificial intelligence and dentistry, and he was teaching actually on social media. Okay, so it was very interesting and in how education is changing, and that more yeah. people are getting their training from following some really good posts or for example following an endodontist and seeing um, the instruction side not just those wow cases um, but actually where they're saying look this is the way I clean this tooth this is why I do it and so a lot of guys are getting into that fa face forward this is how we're, we're how we're doing things and that's becoming where we're starting to get our education so it's very interesting right YouTube um, Instagram, these are going to be the drivers of the future of education. And it's, it's great to see someone young like yourself, who's taken advantage of that and, and has developed that. Now on your Instagram, I noticed a, an amazing case you did. I actually, when I opened the post, I saw the after and I thought, Hey, this is pretty good. Then I saw the before and I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> um, so it was, so I, you know, next time post the before and after so you don't, <laughs> don't hurt people. Um, but let's talk about that case. That's an anterior com uh, uh, composite case yep. um, with, uh, which, which you also did, did a, a big gingivectomy. Yep. Let's talk about the steps uh, just for everybody out there who's getting into this kind of stuff. So it was a very complex case. How did you go through, what were the stages that you did with that case? Yeah. So having a protocol is super important, not only for you as the clinician, but for your team. They're going to feel very frustrated and overwhelmed if you don't have a system in place for these things, because if you're going to take um, anterior aesthetic dentistry into your practice, you need to be prepared for the patients to slightly, uh, you need to be prepared to be flexible because aesthetic dentistry, like I said earlier, is subjective and you need to have that flexibility built into your system. But anyways, what we start out with is a comprehensive exam. So they come in for their recall or their exam or their a consultation. And we start out by making sure that their oral health and systemic health are good to go. If there is any outstanding restorations or um, you know, all the checklist things. We want to make sure their periodontal health is good to go. Everything, all of that has to be good to go first. So we tackle that first. And then when they're in good standing oral health, 
uh, they got the check mark. It's like cutting the red ribbon and you get to move on to the next step and they're super excited and they've worked hard for it. And now you've already got that person invested in this treatment plan. Every one of my anterior cases, even if it's just a composite case, they have to have ha just had a cleaning. Um, I need to know that they're dedicated to their oral health before I'm going to spend hours on, on this. Um, another thing that they agree to is if they have bruxism or if I'm worried about the anterior restorations wrecking, then we are talking about a night guard or, you know, fixing their occlusion ahead of time. Um, if the occlusion is bad enough, we talk about orthodontics and my patients go through full comprehensive Invisalign before I'll do their cases. And now I'm ramping up a bunch of cases because about a year ago I started putting all those people in Invisalign and now they're all finishing around the same time and <laughs> we're just backlogged. Um, but anyways, exam, get everything done. Um, occlusion's good. Everything's healthy. Next step, workup appointment. This is your diagnostics. We're getting the Itero scan or whatever scan you have. We're getting our digital images and we're getting what they want. We're getting a video of them talking. We're getting a video of them explaining what they want. What do they want to change with their smile? And um, x-rays should have already been taken at the exam. Now I take that digital scan and I have it printed and I do a wax up and we create their smile. And I, when I was doing lesser cases, I was doing all, all my own wax ups, but it's been a little overwhelming lately. So I have reeled in the lab on a few cases and we'll digitally design it together. And then they send the um, printed model and I'll make the, I asked them not to make the putty because I am a bit of a perfectionist and I always make changes. <laughs> so I'll uh, make a few changes and, um, have sometimes have the patient input on it if I see them in the clinic, etc. And then the next step is the actual preparation appointment. Um, and then that's, however long, depending on how, however many teeth. And then they come back for their night guard inserts and their final photos. Now, if we're doing a gingivectomy, like that one case that you had spoken about, um, that was actually done three months before we did the other, um, before we did the rest of the work, because I want to make sure that the biological width and the gingival sulcus is established, and I'm not going to be putting my restoration margin in an unknown endpoint. Um, that's how we get recession. So he did cleaning, then gingivectomy, um, and the gingivectomy was planned also digitally. So we created the teeth and then we're like, okay, where are the gums going to be after that? Um, you can't go by just that. You also need to have the probing depths measured to know, okay, this is what looks good, but can we actually achieve that um, safely? Um, if we can, great. If we can't, then there's a little bit of a compromise on the aesthetics, um, but that's that's what we got. Um, for him, we were able to achieve what we wanted just with gingivectomy, and um, we didn't even have to do any crown lengthening. We didn't have to do bone recontouring, um, and it's crazy what one to two millimeters of gingivect gingivectomy can do for a smile. I've done a few cases in the past couple of weeks where I've only done gingivectomy and it's like crazy big change for the patients. So, um, that's a really exciting treatment. And I think a lot of dentists should get into that. What uh, laser are you typically using for that gingivectomy? Uh, I use a diode, but I would like to explore other lasers. Um, that's what we had in the office. So that's what I'm taking advantage of. Um, but it works good. Uh, sometimes if it's a big enough cut, I'll start with a scalpel to be really precise and then I'm just using for cautery at the end. Um, but cautery is great. Patients, um, they've all told me they've felt great after a day, like healing time very short. Um, that's with the laser or electrosurge? Uh, pardon me, sorry. I use a, when I use the scalpel, yeah. I'll use the electrosurge and just kind of cautery after. 
And then also I'll use a diode laser sometimes. Now you're talking Mike's language. And you're yeah. thinking she's not so young after all. She's yeah. breaking out the, the electro surge. <laughs> yeah. That was this. Yeah, the electro surge what we had. That in was the a office. Saskatchewan mainstay yeah. where Mike and I went to school. So that's a really interesting workflow with um, composite. And uh, I like that you tie in uh, the gingivectomy and walk through the timing on that. Make sure you tune in for the second part of this exciting interview with Dr. Nicole Robbins in podcast 35. Again, don't forget to like and subscribe. See our Instagram account at Digital Workflow Dentistry for more information about upcoming webinars, programs, and other information. Take care, everybody.